Steve, it's such a pleasure being back with you here at MIT. It's been almost 30 years since I was here. I've learned so much from you, and uh, the decades kind of float away. Um, I, I, I'm reflecting on your career, beginning as a neuropsychologist, doing hardcore neurophysiology, brain behavior work, and then about the time we worked together, had begun to get involved in social psychology. And putting that together, how do you see, as a brain scientist, a social psychologist, how do you see the nature of consciousness? Well, I think about it as necessarily involving both the study of the organization and development of the brain and uh, the organization and development of the context and the social environment. Uh, we know that uh, in many situations, the environment and the social context have a powerful modulating effect, not only upon behavior in its normal uh, context, but in the effects, in studying the effects, the after effects of brain injury. Experiments beginning in the mid-1930s in which people began to study the effects of brain lesions in the infratemporal cortex, this area here, and more deeply in a region called the amygdala. And a long series of experiments extending over several decades demonstrated that the context in which the animals were observed post-operatively, uh, whether they were maintained in individual isolation cages in a laboratory, as is often the case, or whether they were maintained in a colony cage with other animals, or whether the way they were living in a free-ranging habitat, the effects of the same brain lesion in these different situations were dramatically different. For example, the early observations were that the post-operative effects of, on animals in isolated cages were tameness, among other things. Uh, however, when the same animals or comparable animals were studied in a social context in a colony cage situation, the effects of the uh, operation was a change in dominance hierarchies. Not always in the same direction, not always increasing dominance or reducing dominance. It was quite unpredictable and very complex. It was the same, it was the same lesion. The same lesion. And finally, the same lesion performed in animals living in a free-ranging habitat, the endpoint of the uh, after effects of the surgery was death. The animals simply failed to survive in their original environment, inappropriately responding to social cues, being driven out of the troop, being isolated, failing to forage adequately for food, died of either predation or starvation. So that it's very difficult to imagine talking about the effects of this particular brain lesion as having any simple, singular uh, consequences. The effects depend upon the context in which the behavior is observed. And I think that's a general principle of how the brain is organized and how behavior is organized. And it leads to the notion that consciousness and social behavior and our cognitive maps of the world are created by a process in which our nervous systems are interacting with uh, stimuli impinging upon them from outside, depending upon the nature of the situation that we're in, the same kinds of activation of the same regions of the brain in different contexts produce different behaviors. So that the idea, for example, in recent developments in uh, brain imaging, that you can observe changes in particular parts of the brain under particular experimental conditions, and then drawing conclusions based upon, from those experiments that this particular the brain, part of the brain is responsible for that particular behavior, are subject to the same qualifications, that in order to fully understand the relationship between 
the brain and behavior. The same regions of the, different regions of the brain have to be studied under different environmental conditions. The same area of the brain studied under a variety of conditions. That would make the science much more difficult because instead of controlling one variable with a with a, a, an animal in a, in a stereotaxic device, you now have to do the neurophysiology for, with an animal in a, in a social environment. That adds a lot more variables and complexity. Well, there's no question about it that in order to understand what's going on, you have to pay attention to variables at many levels, which reflects back on the idea that the uh, the only and best and sufficient manner of approaching the study of mental activity and behavior is through the analysis of things going on in the brain. Again, I'm not re suggesting that that's unimportant. It's extremely important, but it's not sufficient. And in humans, that would be even more the case. Even too. more the case. And it's, uh, it's particularly relevant to the current efflorescence of interest in new methods of brain imaging for various uh, law enforcement purposes, for lie detection, uh, the idea that there is a particular pattern of activity in a particular locus of the brain associated with a particular act of dishonesty seems to me to be a very uh, unlikely proposition. So taking that set of data, especially as you've now spent a couple of decades or more in social psychology and yet keeping your f strong footing in the neurosciences, how do you then reflect upon the nature of human consciousness? Well, I tend to think that the problem of human consciousness is really the problem of understanding patterns of interaction between things going on within the organism, within the brain, within different parts of the brain, on the one hand, and things going on in the surrounding context, on the other hand. In a certain sense, I think that consciousness and the concept of the mind introduces the idea that there ought to be a particular category of events that really correspond to these concepts. And it may very well turn out that we will be able to understand consciousness in terms of these interactions, as well as in terms of the subjective experience of being self-aware. I think that, as in many other fields of inquiry, multiple approaches are going to be required. No single approach that looks only at the surrounding social circumstances or at underlying brain uh, activity is going to suffice to help us to understand what it is to really be conscious. Yet many of the people that you and I grew up with, the hardcore neuroscientists, would be moving in the opposite direction, who would say that, sure, social psychology is interesting, it helps us understand human group behaviors, but if you really want to understand consciousness, the only way that you will do it is if you study the agents of the brain, the individual neurons, the gap between the neurons, the synapse, where all the action takes place, the brain systems, that unless you do this, you're not even approaching consciousness, and in fact, nothing else counts. Well, it seems to me to be, unfortunately, a very limited, and I would think, incorrect view. And uh, in defense of that argument, what I would say is that it has always been the aspects of psychological reality that have set the problems for neuroscience, whether in terms of mental health or mental illness, or socially acceptable or unacceptable forms of behavior, uh, there have been repeated attempts to imagine that everything can be reduced to the level of neurobiology and all the problems associated with these uh, issues that I just mentioned can be addressed by uh, focusing solely on the brain. But in the absence of a clear understanding of the other factors that I've been talking about,
I think that all you're doing is collecting a very large amount of information that is going to be very difficult to integrate without a clearer conceptualization of how the internal and external factors relate. Uh, I think it's a harder, uh, a scientifically more difficult, more demanding path, but uh, one that is unavoidable.